Good evening. It's March 28th, 2014. My name is Matthew Ogden, and you're joining us for our weekly broadcast on LarouchePack.com featuring Mr. Lyndon LaRouche. I'm joined in the studio tonight by Cody Jones. We have a series of questions. So we're going to begin this evening with our institutional question, uh, which reads as follows. Given the U.S.-Russia deteriorating relations because of the Crimea situation, there are nuanced and subtle indications by Russia of a possibility to stabilize relations between the United States and Russia. For example, in a recent telephone conversation between Defense Secretary Hegel and Russian Defense Minister Shoigu, it was communicated that the Russians have no intention of any further action in Ukraine unless there is a major provocation from the Western side. In addition, the Russians have indicated that they still see some value in the continuation of the G8 process. What do you recommend to both sides as a starting point to move in the direction of stabilizing relations between Russia and the United States? Well, there's no possibility of stabilizing relations between Russia and Obama. That will never happen. The only way the stabilization would ever occur is the fact that Obama would be thrown out of office. And there's more than adequate justification for doing precisely that on any, almost any given day, any second of any given day, in, in fact. So therefore, Russia is not game, in playing any games whatsoever. They're simply a very simple uh, policy. They're not going to walk into a trap. They're not going to be provoked. They will not accept that. They will make their own judgment about what they should do, and they're not going to start any world war. It's that simple. So don't worry about how we have to negotiate with, between Russia and the United States. First of all, there's nothing to negotiate as long as this president remains president. He's just an, he's just an evil nuisance. It's the, pro the problem is of this nature, and it, you have to repeat it because all of the questions we get usually are wrong. They're relevant, irrelevant. Obama is a menace to civilization, period. But he's only a stooge. He is not the author of anything. The author of everything that's evil is the British Queen. She is the empress of most of the the total of this planet. She's not just the Queen of England. She's the Queen of the British Empire, and as you recall back in during the period of the uh, Copenhagen discussions, she went out with a, a statement saying what her policy was, that she is an empress. She's not a queen of a kingdom. She's an empress. She controls virtually all of Africa, directly or indirectly, she controls the Saudi Arabia and all these terrorist, you know, Islam, Islam, Islamic terrorist groups are all the same thing. They're part of the British operation. So what we have is the British Empire. And the Empire has to be shut down. And Obama is nothing but an instrument of the British Empire. Just as Dirty Dick Cheney was in, on his watch. And he's still out there being Dirty Dick. Um, something like a racial algae story, you know. D dirty dick. But, it, that, but that's the situation. What we have is a real problem as well as these artificial problems. First of all, the British Empire is now faced with the consequences, together with New York, whether it's Wall Street, are faced with the fact that they themselves, after getting rid of what, shall we say, Glass-Steagall, since they got rid of Glass-Steagall, they've operated with a certain intention. It's a British Empire's intention. The intention was to reduce the human population from the vicinity estimated to be about 7 billion people to less than one. That is the war issue. That is the killer issue. That is the only specific issue that really means everything. And everything else is subsidiary. Look, we've starved, almost starved to death, whole parts of our own population in the United States. Why? Because of the cancellation of Glass-Steagall. 
Who did it? The British Empire and its Wall Street adjuncts here in the United States. Uh, that's the issue. The intention was to reduce the human population along the Zeus lines, which are the lines of the Roman Empire, which did the same thing, reduced the population, used mass murder methods and so forth, the same thing that the British are doing now and that Obama is doing now. Huh? Obama is essentially a, like a Nero figure. He's, he's less intelligent than Nero. Uh, of course, I don't think he sings, for example. <laughs> But that's probably a plus. <laughs> so th that's the situation. What we're on the verge of is a global thermonuclear war. Now, if you know you have an enemy which is going determined to launch a thermonuclear war on the basis of causing an extinction of the majority of the population of this planet in short order, if you know that, you don't bother provoking the beast. You simply lay your plans of how you're going to try to deal with this in your understanding of what the forces are on the planet. For example, in Western Europe, essentially Germany is no longer an asset of the British Empire on this issue. You have similar kinds of things. France is being bro broken. Other parts of Europe are being broken. Spain and Portugal are being destroyed. And so they're, they're, Europe, as, as such, is already being destroyed. And as under these conditions, it will be destroyed. And Germany, which has a certain kind of interest in the East, because Germany has a, v a very important role in the economy of Central Europe. And it's a very close relationship to that of Russia in many respects. It's not simply they have some kind of deal, some kind of agreement in terms of allies or something. It simply is a matter of practice. They have vital common interests as nations. It's not because they're marrying each other, it's because they have vital common interest, particularly commercial interests and related kinds of interests, security interests. So with the what we're dealing with, we have one problem, and every American who's got any brains should recognize it. Our problem is, is the Queen of England. That's the number one problem. Our number two problem is what Obama represents. But it, what, uh, that num what he represents is Wall Street. Now we're in a point of fact where certain things are inevitable. Wall Street is doomed. Wall Street is finished in its present form. There's nothing you can do to save Wall Street. It's all going down. Now, the issue is, how will Wall Street go down? Wall Street has two ways to go down. One is to take a nosedive. I mean, just get off of the 70-story uh, uh, building and jump. That's one way to settle the issue. And so, some people will do that. We know the record on that, on that sort of thing. But so Wall Street is finished as such. The British Empire is, is, controls Wall Street entirely. They're using it. The British Empire is absolutely determined to achieve the objectives of Queen Elizabeth, actually the second, um, the, queen, uh, the, the British Imperial Queen now. And therefore, we know that's the fact. There's no way you're going to change that by argument or by negotiation. No point to that. What you have to do is defeat it. Now, the, intent, there, the reason for the intensity of the war threat is that nine, the bail-in process, which was started around the end of last year and the beginning of this year, where they went from bail-out to bail-in, Bail-in is a self-accelerating form of, cl of collapse of the entire financial markets. Now, the British Empire's position is, if they ha get by with a war and crash the planet, they don't care about lost money. But if the rest of the planet is surviving and they go bad, they're finished. So the question is, who's going to finish who off? Is the British Empire going to finish off the United States as well as other parts of the world? Or is the United States going to be sane enough to bankrupt the British Empire? Now, every patriot who's got a brain in his head that's functioning knows what we want to do. is The best thing that could happen to us is we should drive the British Empire bankrupt and Wall Street together. 
Because then, from my standpoint, and I know this thing better than most people do, Glass-Steagall. But Glass-Steagall is not enough. Glass-Steagall will bankrupt Wall Street. Fine. I don't care what falls, happens to Wall Street banks. We don't need them. We in the United States do not need the Wall Street banks. Now, we may get, get some of them on our, on our back, back. But what will happen, they will go through bankruptcy. Because the second thing, which is what I demand we do, I demand it not because I'm personally demanding it, but I'm demanding it because it's absolutely essential. What we have to do is we have to go back to Alexander Hamilton and the original uh, design of our con Constitution. If we do that, then what happens, we'll close down all these kinds of operations. We won't close down all the banks. What we will do is put them through bankruptcy reorganization. We will look at what's in there that has some merit to it, as, as a, you know, salvage it. And what we will do then is we will have the uh, Secretary of the Treasury of the United States following the design of Alexander Hamilton and also that of some other presidents who had the similar design. Roosevelt had a similar, Franklin Roosevelt had a similar design. So what we'll do is we'll say, henceforth, all banking in the United States you know, will be authorized through, federally through the Treasury Department. In other words, the Treasury Department will be the guarantor of the management of banking systems. They can be private banking systems, but they must have an authorization to do that do business which is based on the Treasury Department. On that basis, what we can take some of these banks, which are worthless on Wall Street now, but maybe they have something in there we want to save. So therefore, we see something that we want to save. We'll say, cancel that crap. We're not, we're not supporting you. If you've got something in there that's worth saving as a banking deposit operation, we're going to help you as long as you conform to rules. Under those conditions, if I were president now, and I will not, will not be president, that's obvious, but if I were in the position of advising the people who will be the presidency, what I would propose is those two measures. First of all, Glass-Steagall, that saves the United States. Secondly, in order to save the economy of the United States, we have to go to a banking system which is, runs its authorization through the Treasury Department. Now, this would be correspond to what happened with Abraham Lincoln in installing greenbacks. Greenbacks were a system of credit authorized by the federal government through the Treasury Department. And this is what enabled the United States to defeat the British Empire when the British Empire, through its Confederacy tools, were on the verge of destroying the United States. So Lincoln's action in going to the U.S. Treasury, saying these other banks were fake, and then saying, authorize, giving greenback credits to legitimate institutions, we saved the United States. And therefore, it's those two policies of economic policies, two aspects of it, which are essential at this point. Without those two measures, there is no secure method, message for us on saving the world economy. It can go into a chaotic crash. In other words, you have to have something to bring some order into this process. And we have to follow, therefore, since we are the United States, we have to follow our Constitution, which men, most of our presidents have not done, haven't bothered to do. We follow our Constitution, and it worked. It worked before. It worked with an attempt by Franklin Roosevelt. It worked with Abraham Lincoln. It worked with uh, others earlier. The same kind of idea. Especially with John Quincy Adams, who was a genius in this matter. So that's what we do. That is the only solution to this, this aspect of the crisis. We say to the world, we are the United States. We have some swindlers from Britain who've come in and taken over our institutions by bribery, by corruption, by British cor corruption. We are now canceling that game. We're now going back to our constitution. And our law is based on our constitution, not the British Empire. The problem is, what we've done is we degraded our citizens 
in the most part, they're crawling on the ground, begging for bits and pieces. Members of the Congress, Senate and House of Representatives, are crawling on the ground, licking the dirt for Wall Street and London. And the problem is a moral default in our system. The cowardice which took over the United States, especially since the end of Glass-Steagall, has demoralized the people of the United States, whether it's 75 percent or so, of our citizens hate Obama, and quite justly so. But they're so beaten down, they won't fight. They will be enraged. They'll curse but they won't speak out. You have members of the Congress who are cringing on the floor, licking the, licking the aisles, the rugs on the aisles. Won't fight. Won't fight. Gutless wonders. And they turn into you know, evil fellows. People who are defeated um, become crooks because they can't m make an honest living. So they steal a little bit. They cheat. They lie, like some of the bills that were passed in the Senate, in the House recently. This, is, this was demoralization. This is disgusting. This was practically treason. But they did it. Why? Because they were scared. Some were scared of Wall Street because their elections de are depend on Wall Street contributions to the candidates for election. They're not exactly stalwart citizens. Mem most members of the Senate and House of Representatives are not stalwart citizens. They may have somewhere in their remains, here in some part of the academy or not, they have something left in them which is still a patriot. But they're, before being a patriot, they're cowards first, and patriots maybe. Well, I want to follow up with what you said about the British Empire. As people know, President Obama is in Saudi Arabia today, meeting with the Saudi King Abdullah to reassure him of Obama's commitment to the U.S.-Saudi relationship. In the context of this meeting, administration officials announced that Obama is considering a decision to allow supplies of portable missile launchers to be provided to the rebels in Syria, and that the Saudis could play a direct role in providing these weapons. Uh, these so-called man pads would give the rebels the capability of shooting down planes, including commercial airliners. Uh, this decision would make a dramatic escalation in U.S. support for the rebels in Syria, which had up to this point been limited to only small weapons and so-called humanitarian aid. Now, at the same time that Obama is in Saudi Arabia, there is growing pressure inside the United States to force Obama to declassify the infamous 28 pages of the 9-11 Joint Inquiry Report which reportedly detailed direct Saudi support for the 9-11 hijackers. The fact that this evidence continues to be covered up at the highest level means that the terror apparatus is still in place and is continuing to be used to run new 9-11 type irregular warfare operations such as that that you've asserted we are seeing in the case of the Malaysian Airlines flight MH370. And all of this with the complicity of those who are perpetuating this cover-up and protecting this apparatus. Now, um, I would like to bring a graphic onto the screen. Uh, last week and earlier this evening, you made the point that the Saudis are by no means an independent actor. The Saudi kingdom is merely a subsidiary of the British Empire, and the Saudi operation has to be seen merely as an arm of British imperial policy. We see this connection between the BAE 
and Saudi Arabia with Prince Bandar's oil for guns agreement that he used for decades to supply clandestine terror operations around the globe. We also see the Saudi support for the Chechens against Russia and the Uyghurs against the Chinese. Now, earlier this week, uh, you commissioned this map to be made, which shows the true extent of the power of the British Empire. We have it on the screen now. The different shadings here represent different categories of imperial control. Uh, black signifies current flashpoints for war. The dark red shows territories that are under direct British control. The lighter red is the NATO military alliance. And the lightest shading of red marks those countries whose sovereignty is severely compromised by either London's dope incorporated narco terror apparatus, including the Saudi funded Islamic extremism, or the Wall Street City of London speculative banking system. And as you can see, this leaves a very small handful of countries who have any sovereignty left. And those countries right now are the ones being targeted for thermonuclear blackmail or annihilation. So I guess my question for you is following up on the opening statements that you made about the flawed uh, belief that underlies axiomatically almost every question about global strategy that you get. How do we correct the flawed idea of strategy to realize that the true enemy of mankind is this British imperial system? Well, the situation is such as under our Constitution, the Congress, which in this matter has a final authority, that is when, when the uh, executive branch comes under a president who is unfit for office, then the proceeding is to put that president and those who are complicit in his actions to bring them into a uh, process of impeachment. This impeachment means the removal of the great, either great penalties to an, a continued incumbent presidency, that is, he can no longer operate except within l limited boundaries, or he's totally bereft of his power as a president, or that he's not only bereft of that power and it's thrown out of office, but he's subject to actual continuing uh, criminal activity for which he's punished and goes to prison probably and probably for a very long time, in a case like Obama. When you think the crimes that Obama has committed as president, and th then add that to what Cheney did as the acting president, but uh, you know, the vice president, he's, and Cheney is very good advice, um, from my experience. Um, so therefore, that's, what, that's where we stand. So the, the question is, where do we find the guts among the members of Congress who are now responsible, since we know this, this president is no good, He's violated the Constitution, violated. there's no reason for him to remain in office. And he certainly would be qualified to be suspended from office, or, or suspended in part, uh, that is put under management. Uh, but these things are not occurring. So therefore the time has come that to save the United States, and to save the peace of the world, it is essential to put this president in, under impeachment. And it's also essential that he be, the impeachment be processed fully. And that's the, essentially what the reality we're facing now. The question is, who will get the guts in the Congress to do what is their moral responsibility to the nation? You, ha you, you, you don't have the right to be a gutless wonder in the U.S. Constitution, under the U.S. Constitution. You are supposed to represent the people of the United States in whole, in part, but also in part otherwise. You are responsible morally to the citizens who you normally represent. And if you can't do that job, you should be thrown out of office and impeached for lack of duty. Of of duty. We have to because the only way considering the gutlessness to which our citizenry has been debased. I mean, you've got 75 percent, at least, of the U.S. Uh, citizenry hates Obama. Why is Obama still in power? 
because they have been reduced to almost sheep. They will not fight. They will hate. They will complain. But they won't do anything to help themselves because they've been so much crushed, especially since the Cheney administration. Now, and now on the question of this, what did Cheney do? Cheney was the guy who put through the ban on revealing the essence of what happened in 9-11. The world as whole knows what happened on 9-11. Officially, the United States government says you can't talk about it. Huh? Which means this is a fraud in, in principle. It's a fraud in which you have two people who are guilty. The first is Dirty Dick Cheney, because he's the one who was the engineer of this thing. You know, George Bush Jr. was just a silly little jerk. He didn't do much of anything, good or bad. Dick Cheney, Dirty Dick Cheney, was a skunk who did most of the crimes, and who also the crimes which was continued under Obama. And Dirty Dick Cheney is the guy you got to really hold to account. Now, on the other side, the world as a whole knows that 9-11 was a job done by the British Empire, largely through the instrumentality of the British Empire's puppet, Saudi Arabia. We have also a fact that since the beginning of the two Chechen wars on the borders of Russia, that the entire planet has been persecuted by a series of wars spread from the two Chechen wars, spread throughout the, largely the Muslim world. So the Muslim world as a whole, which is part of the British Empire, uh, and it's over a billion people involved in this, in the Muslim world. And there's things beyond that which have the same influence, accomplices. So therefore, if we're going to have peace on this planet, if we're going to have a safe living on this planet, considering all the other space, we, from nearby space, it could be threats, and are threats. Therefore, we have to take this action. And no one can stand with it up and hold their head on high, who doesn't do, it hasn't got the guts and willingness to do exactly what I'm saying must be done. We already know who did 9-11. We know that it was done under Ch the Cheney administration protection. Not poor dopey Bush, Bush. But Cheney is responsible for 9-11. Because he was the one that covered up the authorship. And it was not much of a cover-up. It was just a, a, a federal order and called a law. You can't tell the truth about 9-11. But we know what 9-11 was. We know that the British were back with, financed together with the Saudis 9-11. We know that the Saudis did 9-11. We know that it was the ambassador to the United States of Saudi Arabia who directed and coordinated that operation against our people. And practically everybody in the Congress who's got any sentimental feelings at all knows who did it. Except they don't want to be caught saying they knew who did it. And Obama today is fully backing that Cheney operation. Therefore, He's impeachable on that account alone. Because he is, the, he is the one that's blocking the truth about a murderous attack, a virtual act of war against the people of the United States. And these two clowns called presidents are guilty of betraying the United States. They are traitors, in fact, to the United States. Traitors who work on behalf of a foreign power called the British Empire. And I dare anyone to try to tell me that ain't true. Okay. <clears throat> well, this week we've seen a number of statements that confirm exactly what you've been saying about what the policy of the empire is in terms of the financial system which is a policy of bail-in 
which is now replacing the hyperinflation policy of bailout, which they had previously. Um, this is first revealed by the warnings from Standard & Poor's to most of the European banks, saying that because of your adoption of what's known as the single resolution mechanism, which is a unification of all of Europe under one bail-in policy to implement the kind of things that we saw um, imposed on Greece, where the creditors and, I mean, the depositors and the bondholders of the bank, they're the ones who are forced to take the haircut, so to speak, to bail out the big, too big to fail banks. Then you also had this policy or this um, study put out by the New York Federal Reserve, again, calling for bail-in as the solution to whatever types of problems people might be recognizing on uh, a paper called Why Bail In and How. So it's very clear that this is the policy currently of the empire. Go for bail in. Go for bail in. Save the too big to fail banks at any cost. And that it's this crisis in the financial system which is also then driving the acceleration towards war. Now in your first answer you made it very clear exactly what the what the prescription is for this. Glass-Steagall, a move towards a Hamiltonian credit system, etc. So that's clear and it should be reasonable and understandable to any thinking person. So I guess the question then becomes, given the clarity of what the solution should and could be, what one is blocking the Congress from taking the appropriate actions or the institutions that could act from taking the appropriate actions and then for the average citizen what can they do and where do they turn to find optimism in what otherwise seems like a very desperate and, and, and dire situation well you have to understand that our most of our citizens have been reduced to cowardice it, it, worse than that they've been induced to, introduced to stupidity if you look at the educational processes which our current generation of underage students are, are, even some of our professors I suppose too, that they just simply are, are gutless wonders who have no real understanding of anything. Look, if you've got children out there who don't know what their sex is, who don't know what money is, who don't know anything about, about anything, well, these, these are the victims. They've been reduced. Our obligation is not to go out there and say, you're at fault, Mr. Stupid Person. We know why you were stupid, because you, of the school you attended, yeah? of what your teachers taught you. Teachers who are more, have more increasingly more criminal qualities than they do educational. We, we have actually have no competent education system to speak of, except in very rare and spotty and diminishing places in the United States. So the point is, we have destroyed the citizen of the in intellectual capability of being able to make reasonable judgments. And this has been done, and through the promotion of the drug trafficking, which came in big since the beginning of the 1960s, and became a torrent in the second half of the 1960s. People don't know what sex or what species they are practically as a result of these processes. They have no skills. In fact, mo we have almost no industries left in the United States. There are none left. You say they get paid? Well, they used to say you get paid anyway. But then we find out with the recent, recent laws, which are pushed through by Obama, they don't get paid either. They're just told to starve. Which is a, you know, when the governments say, you are going to starve, they're saying, we're going to kill you. It's the law demands that we kill you by slow torture of starvation. We destroy your families. We take away your houses, which Wall Street took, stole from you. Huh? You send them out in packed to get diseases and to die. And they call this democracy? No, the problem is, when a time like this, you need people who will defend the flag, of which I am one. Huh? Defend the flag. Defend our Constitution. Our Constitution is being violated. 
It's being treated with disgust, contempt. And therefore, those of us who still have the brains to understand what this is all about have a compelling responsibility to act on behalf of our fellow citizens whose ability to think clearly about these matters has been damaged. We have to, re we have to be loyal to those who came before us and those who are bound to come after us. While we have the ability to think clearly, to know the facts, to know the evidence, we have the responsibility as citizens to act and to take action in concert with others who agree with this to save our nation and save our constitution which is being spit upon by dirty Dick Cheney and by Obama but all under the command of a woman a virtual, a virtual Satanist Queen Elizabeth II she really is the second it was the first one you know was was Shakespeare's time huh? and she's more evil the other one was very bad tempered and killed people She's very bad tempered, very bad tempered, and she kills people on the mass. And so if there we have to defend the United States against the British Empire, which is our essential enemy, and always has been since we were a republic. The British Empire today is still the enemy of the United States. If that's one flag, the Union jerk, which we don't salute. And that's the way, that's, you have to understand things in those ways. We, ha we are the people. When our president is a crook, when mo many of the Congress are stinking cowards and won't do anything to defend our people, Co members of Congress who lie by right, the votes they make because they want Wall Street money for their election campaigns. Corruption of the worst type. Therefore, we have to stand up and we have to fight to save our republic. We have to do this for humanity. Because whether we as the United States, if, if we go down, they go down. The rest go down. Therefore, we, are, we must defend our nation, not only for our own nation's sake, but for others and for the future of humanity. Therefore, those of us who can speak must speak and act insofar as we're able to act. Now, the people of Europe this week um, got to witness a very stark contrast between Obama, on one hand, who is on tour to promote the empire's agenda for a direct confrontation with Eurasia and Russia, and Xi Jinping, on the other hand, uh, who is also in Europe, uh, but for the opposite purpose, for promoting the new Silk Road and the peaceful integration of all the countries of Eurasia. Uh, Xi Jinping wrote an article that was published yesterday in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, uh, where he emphasized the importance of the Chinese-German partnership, making the point that these two countries embody the best of their respective civilizations and geographically represent the two crucial nodes between which a real Eurasian integration could take place. He said, The numerous ancient scholars and philosophers, profound philosophical thinking, rich and colorful literature and art that our two countries have been proud to have are an inexhaustible source of wisdom for our two countries to learn from, to draw upon, and to share in our exchanges and cooperation. The China-Germany cooperation is also a process in which our two economic miracle, miracle creators work hand in hand and make progress together. Our two economies are likely are highly complementary and promise a vast space for cooperation. And then he said that closer cooperation between China, a country which is committed to a path of peaceful development, and Germany would go a long way to forming a multipolar world and a, what he called a world of peace, stability, and prosperity. Now, I think this theme of a partnership between China and Germany 
is one that your wife, Helga Tseplerush, would agree with wholeheartedly. In fact, many of the points that President Xi Jinping made reflect some of the same themes that Helga emphasized during her recent trip to China, in which she had numerous very high-level meetings and was interviewed by a large number of leading Chinese press. Uh, for example, in an interview published in the Beijing Review called The Silk Road to Prosperity, uh, Helga Tseplerush said, There is a general recognition in the world that the new Silk Road is only the beginning of a much larger integration of the world economy. We are very happy about this initiative because it will be the beginning of a completely new epic for civilization. We need to change the paradigm quickly and abandon the idea of solving problems through war and stop thinking in terms of geopolitics. We must focus on the common aims of mankind or we all may not exist. Now, just to conclude, um, Xi Jinping echoed this vision of what he called a new epic for mankind in a speech that he gave yesterday in Paris. And I think he described it in a really beautiful way, both what you've been stressing, Lynn, about the end of war, uh, but also the future of a community of respectively sovereign but mutually cooperating nation states. He said, throughout the centuries, people have yearned for a lasting peace, but war has haunted mankind every step of their progress. As we speak, many children on this planet are subjected to the horrors of armed conflicts. We must do our utmost to keep war as far away as possible from mankind so that children around the world can grow up happily under the sunshine of peace. As long as the idea of peace can strike deep roots and the sail of peace can be hoisted in the hearts and minds of people all over the world, a strong defense where will be built to prevent and stop war. Civilizations have become richer and colorful with exchanges and mutual learning, which form an important drive for human progress and global peace and development. Every civilization is unique. Each are crystallizations of mankind's hard work and wisdom. We need to encourage different civilizations to respect one another and live together in harmony while promoting exchange of mutual learning as a bridge of friendship among people a driving force behind human progress, and a strong bond to human peace. So my question for you is, as we face the imminent collapse of the British transatlantic financial system, how do you see the possibility of replacing that with this lasting peace based on a shared human culture of a post-Zeusian, post-Empire world? I guess, how do you envision a new Promethean age for mankind? Precisely. Well, the first thing you have to do is all these things which are said in these remarks already as part of the question, they are, they are in a sense self-evident. They're self-evident to people of goodwill, essentially. But they do not solve the problem. The problem is, is that beginning in the beginning of the year 1900, in Paris, a meeting on the subject of Account, really accounting what it really was, but in terms of this kind of this sense of things, in terms of arithmetic, what happened is in 1900, the system of education, which had been increasingly taking over since 1900 in pa in Paris, where this crazy idea was put into place, hmm, is the problem, because if you want to destroy a people. You can do that by simple oppression. The easier way is to make them stupid. And that you have the problem, we have made our own citizens in the United States since the, you know, the presidency of our last decent real president. Huh? Since that time, we have been increasingly made stupid in science and everything else since 1900 in Paris. This was followed up, this piece of stupidity was followed up by Bertrand Russell. And Bertrand Russell destroyed the ability of the human mind to think as human. 
Now, we still had a few people who were qualified as scientists, but their qualifications became relatively diminished. There are very few capable scientists in either Europe or the United States today who are actual, actually capable of performing a science driver program. Why? Because they are absolutely impotent. They're intellectually impotent. The green policy, the fact that the green policy could exist, means that you, you people have gone back to becoming animals. They're no longer human. A green policy is a denial of the difference of, of hum, human beings from animals. The green people are intrinsically a form of animal, artificial animals. They are not truly human in their thinking. Now, if you have the green policy, there's no hope for humanity anyway. That's the British policy. And this was all done by, under British influence. In other words, finally you had, in the 1890s, before the year 1900 in Paris, before that you had two of the greatest scientists in all history were leading science. Hmm? Two of the greatest, Max Planck and Albert Einstein. What there was was a re direct reversal, which was global. It has been global ever since. A decline in the intellectual capability of the members of the human species. Now you still have people who are scientists who in their most private and most secret think thinking will still recall things that were science. Some of them still have scientific capabilities. But they, they are, look at what Obama did to it. Obama destroyed science. Huh? Cheney ruined science. Obama destroyed it. People, people who think like uh, under Obama are no longer really truly human. They've lost the essential difference of creativity which exists for the human species individual. They don't have it anymore. Or they're so scared they don't use it anymore. And this is where the problem really lies. So therefore, if we're going to solve these problems, which our Chinese friend does, which Helga has been working on on the Silk Road for decades. She's actually a hero in China on the basis of her pioneering on the Silk, Silk Road project. So the problem here is it's not, there are no simple agreements, treaty agreements. There has to be a substantive agreement. The substantive agreement means that science must come back to become science. Now, for example, mathematics is not science. Mathematics is not scientific. It has no scientific content as such. Numbers have no content for human beings. Human beings are a noetic species, a creative species. No animal is. I am a human being not a green animal. The greenies are essentially evil because they've turned themselves as human bodies and human minds, they've turned themselves into mere animals. They no longer have judgment. They no longer have competent opinions. They should all be in a mental asylum until they're cured of these diseases. They shouldn't be running anything. They shouldn't be voting. They shouldn't be making policies. They're not mentally responsible. They're not capable of mental responsibility. The human species is a creative species. It's by the will of the human individual, not the brain, but through the mind. And the mind is, a, the mind is essentially a social product of the evolution of ape, man from ape, or something like ape. So the difference is, do you have this quality which distinguishes man from the ape? Otherwise, you shouldn't vote. We don't let, we don't let two-year-old children vote, do we? We don't let five-year-olds, do we? Not ten years old. We may get that, that, may, that may happen to us. Eh? But this is, this is not human. Because the ability to do any good, and the principle is, as you know, our friends in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, to do good. Huh? To do good bed. Huh? That's what it's all about. So therefore, it's not sufficient to have these mottos and to say we're going to have peace and goodwill and equity and so forth. It's not enough. For example, the sun has gone into, as we've been discussing in the basement repeatedly recently, 
the sun has gone into a protracted quiet period. Henceforth, from now until we don't know how many decades to come, the entire western part of the, Massachusetts, of, of the United States, huh? from the Mississippi River to the Pacific Ocean, is now going to be, cease to be a food growing area. Heretofore, the major source of food in the United States for the people of the United States has been in that territory of food growing and related things. We no longer have that capability. So therefore the green people are the enemies of humanity. They're the enemies of the United people of the United States in particular. Fracking is a crime against humanity, which was imposed through the aid of Cheney, was imposed on the United States. So we no longer have, we've lost our food production. We've turned food into charcoal, to fuel, not food. Mass murder against our people is going on under the Cheney legacy and by, continued by Obama. And we call ourselves competent to vote in the Congress on law. These wretches who don't have the brains to know which door to go out of because they're cowards. And you go back to 19, eight, 1900 in Paris, the Hilbert Doctrine. Eliminate science and replace it with mathematics. And everything in all modern science says that mathematics is not science. Numbers are not science. Then we have music, which is not music anymore. Junk. We have theater, which is not theater. It's junk. It's like a whorehouse performance. There is no longer a culture of the United States. There's a fragments of a culture which left over from what has been in the past. And therefore, if we want to solve these problems, we have to understand that the human species has a very specific quality which no other species has. It's called a noetic quality the ability of, of mankind to create new states in the universe by the will of the human mind. That's mankind. If you violate that and reject that, mankind is going to be extinct. And there's no sign of anything to replace mankind that we know about in the universe so far. So the, the idea of merely saying we've got to pro promise these good things and be nice to each other is not going to solve anything. It's simply you're going to have a slow death with mutual admiration, but it's still slow death. We, what we need to do is to fulfill mankind. Mankind has the power of creativity. The individual human being has a natural ability to create new states in the universe before, when no, such states never existed before. And it's only through that power of creativity of the human mind, that the human mind becomes human. Otherwise, you're just monkeys. And monkeys are not good at running pol political systems. You should see the racist monkeys in the, in the zoo. They are not at all things you want around. Hmm? So therefore, this is the issue. The issue is, are we going to be able to sustain the inherent mission of the human species? And the human species is unique in the power to make discoveries, essentially in the form of chemistry, we go to increasingly higher energy flux density per capita and per unit of, of action. That is the only thing that enables the human species to exist. Therefore, if you're going to do something for the world, you better get on a high horse, on thermonuclear fusion, and more advanced expressions of thermonuclear fusion, which involve the lunar use of helium-3, to enrich this thing. We can do this on Earth by bringing the helium-3 from the moon down to Earth and incorporate it in the thermonuclear fusion program. That's the only way we're ever going to meet that challenge. Now, there are people in China, for example, who do know this. They're specializing in this. They've made efforts and explorations on the moon and what are their journeys up there, which pertain to exactly this. So the, the future of mankind depends upon the development of a scientific technology which is thermonuclear fusion in various advanced forms. 
without that, during the period of the quiet time of the sun, in which the world is going to get drier and drier and drier, especially our United States, we have to have thermonuclear fusion. Now, China is on the track of saying we're going to do that. Russia is oriented to the same direction. India is oriented in the same direction. So the question, are we going to use the weapons of progress, of creative progress, be on behalf of a world which no longer has war on it? You may have police actions to keep people from, from going disorderly in a cruel way. But we don't want war. We don't need it anymore. War, in general, is something that must be eliminated from this planet. Because any major war, planet-wide, is a thermonuclear war. And a thermonuclear war today is an extinction of humanity war. So therefore, our thing, we must have peace among nations based on the cultural characteristics of a nation. Because the, the people can only function efficiently if they have a language and knowledge that goes with it, which enables them to be productive. Therefore, we must not disturb that. We must enhance that. We must increase their mutual capabilities. Then what, he's, what he was saying, what the Chinese uh, the Premier was saying, yeah, that can be, but this must be included. We can't take a cheap shot and ignore this. The fundamental issue of mankind is mankind is not an animal. Mankind is a noetic species, which is capable of it voluntarily increase his creative powers, and which is no longer relies on mathematics. Mathematics is the sign of death of the human species. It has certain uses, but has no scientific use. Other things have scientific use. Okay, well, as for the final question, you've already addressed much of what would come up in this, but I think maybe there's another side you could even elaborate further. Now, we've, there was a very disturbing report that came out of New York City this week about what's happening in the New York City schools, where they've experienced 10 suicides in just the last seven weeks. And I think this really it expresses this orientation that the youth now have of a no future orientation. And in fact, this no future identity, it's been accelerating since the assassination of John Kennedy. And it's been accelerating under really a doctrine imposed by the likes of Bertrand Russell, which is, you know, the idea that to deny the existence of the human mind and to reduce, try to reduce the human being down to the level of just a logical machine. Right, a mathematical machine. Now we've discussed that Gödel intervened into this to give a negative proof against what Russell was attempting to demonstrate, to show that in fact there are inherent contradictions to this idea of trying to demonstrate the mind as something of nothing more than a logical system. But it was only a negative proof. What's required now is a positive affirmation of exactly what the nature of the human mind is. And we've got to get young people to, again, come to know and realize what that positive identity is. You know, it's one thing to tell someone you're not a monkey, but then the question is, well, then, if I'm not a monkey, what am I? So in that context, what role must culture play in this? And what do you prescribe as the kind of pathway which we should be initiating in order to revive and awaken this real human potential? Okay. We've got a very clear case. It's, it's not all-inclusive, but it's, it's significant in the sense that it does demonstrate the point. Now, what happened was in 1900, exactly that year, with the, what actually was taken over by Bertrand Russell. And this whole thing, the attempt to find a mathematical solution for this problem was a fallacy. But the, what the fall, the, what, what part of it was merely negative. That is what was done in, in defense uh, uh, against this thing was merely negative. What I've insisted upon, and what I still insist upon, is that we have to have a positive understanding of what human creativity is. 
And the problem is the scientists in general, especially out of the influence, remember you have to understand, if it, you had the 1890s, now this is a, gr a very crucial decade. First of all, it followed the uh, expulsion of Bismarck from the Chancellery. And Bismarck had been the only Chancellor, the only means in Europe, which prevented a general warfare throughout Europe at that time. That is, he, he managed to manage the planet with his diplomatic work to prevent the British Empire from starting a global war. Huh? So when they removed him, when they had a new appointee by the British Empire to replace Bismarck, a new representative the government, then the whole thing went into a period of warfare from that moment, beginning with the assassination of the President of France and some other things that happened in the whole series of wars leading directly into 1914. So actually World War I began with the ouster of Bismarck from the Chancellery. That's history. We've been in such a process of war, warfare, ever since that time that Bismarck was kicked out of the Chancellery. There, is, there have been resting periods, so-called, but there were resting periods to start a new war. World War I and World War II were part of the same thing. And we're now on the verge of World War III, which is the extinction warfare. So therefore, what you have to look at is say, what's wrong? The very idea that you can use a mathematical system to define a few higher technology is a fraud. What ha all successful growth in technology, in applied technology, is based on human activity, not mathematics. Now, they, they will quantify the parts they put together, but the action which causes the improvement is not, li li is not mathematical. You can measure mathematics in terms of the quantities you're bringing together to use to create an effect. But the, the solution does not lie. It lies in chemistry. That is chemistry per se. It does not rely on numbers. Now, first of all, foremost, what is creativity? What species of, of life has a voluntary, direct capability for creating a higher state of existence of the human species? There's only one species that can do that voluntarily, the human mind's species. Mathematics will never enable you to discover anything except a crack in the floor. So that's what the issue is. Now, therefore, that means, well, let's, let's take a case. I just recently pushed, I've started the first of several reports on the principle of creativity and how physical science is defined. And what I'm saying in, in that thing is absolutely correct. Because there was the, 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 the model case for this, which I used, which is the most relevant one, is that you had Brun, Brunelleschi, was a man who eliminated lines. Straight lines don't exist for Brunelleschi. And he was one of the greatest architects that ever existed. He created a, a, cube, a, a chapel. If you walked into the chapel, as I had done with my wife on a number of occasions, there, uh, the whole chapel resonates musically to your presence. It's just a brick structure. So he was the, he was the one who broke apart all conceptions of straight lines and similar kinds of things, derivative of straight lines, number, numerical structures. Huh? He was the foundation of all modern science. Then you had Cusa came along, Nicholas of Cusa, the greatest intellect of the entire period of the Renaissance. And he went to the other thing, the, the maximum principle. Now the maximum principle was solved by Kepler, because Kepler discovered the solar system. Nobody ever else discovered the solar system except Johannes Kepler. No one. So you had these three, pro these three propositions. Brunelleschi, the absolute minimum. Everything has to be based on the absolute minimum. Hmm? Then you had to go to the maximum, hmm? the largest, hmm? from the very large. Then you had Kepler. 
and Kepler, does, Kepler created all competent modern science with that, with that discovery, by completing that. We have the same thing happen in the, after Gauss, a similar thing, build up. Gauss never used, he never used mathematics per se for any of his theoretical discoveries. He would tell them, how, well, here's how I did it. He wouldn't tell them how he did it. He would just describe how it was done. Hmm? And he had a student, Bernhard Riemann, one of the greatest gen geniuses, scientific geniuses, of the entire 19th century. And Riemann opened the case for the work discoveries by Planck, Max Planck. Max Planck discovered in the infinitesimal the principle of science in the infinitesimal, in a new form. Then Einstein took the, again, the same pace, the maximum. That was their science. And that's how this thing works. So what you have to have is you have to get out of this idea of mathematics, because if you say science is mathematics, you're a nut. Because the science has never been existed that is, as a deliberate process, except in this way, except through the human mind. No other creature than the human mind has ever made a discovery, a principle that was valid. The problem is that in the schools today, and increasingly since the influence of the, 18, the 1900 period, since that time, there has been an accelerated degeneration of the mental life of people in respect to science. In putting things together, yes, great things have been have done. Some people with great genius have done these things, but they don't get much credit for having done it. They're the ones who made the discovery. They don't get the they don't get much of the credit. <laughs> there are not many Einsteins around, but it's Einsteins and that type and Pranks, Riemanns, people like that who create human creativity in a modern scale today. Without them, we don't get creativity. We get hell. So the, the important thing is you don't treat the human being anymore as an animal. Never treat human beings as animals. Human beings are creative, intrinsically creative. And they don't, they don't use numbers to make discoveries. They will count things but they're just objects. The process of creativity doesn't just count things. And therefore, what we need is we need to return to an actual physical scientific program, which starts the, the child at the age of three, four, and five, starts down that path of creativity, in which adults used to chain their children if they were wise. They would teach the children how to play games. And the child's learning how to play games would give the child a sense of an ordering, which was not just mathematical. And if we went further and further, then we could go higher on the scale. But the idea that mathematics, the statistics, that accountants, accountants are more of a curse. They didn't exist, really, until about 1812. Accountants really didn't exist. We didn't need them then. They were just an embarrassment, a corporate embarrassment. What we need is a scientific basis for progress, for the increase of the productive powers of labor. Just like always big, higher machines, more productive machines, new technologies on a higher level, the ability of mankind to have an increased standard of living by virtue of having higher levels of technological progress. That's what we must be. That's being human. Unfortunately, what's going on in schools today, like these suicides in, Bo in New York City, why is a student have committing suicide? Why are these students committing suicide? Why are they doing that? Because life is meaningless to them. And every child, that, you know, no child likes to be held back in grades. And if they're going back to school after school, and they're in the horror situation of the New York City school system, and it's not the teachers as such. There have been good teachers that are being thrown out as, rap as rapidly as possible now.
but with it, we had the educational process of teaching, inspiring students to be able to make discoveries with their own minds. And teachers who, I, my, my, my course in my experience in schools was terrible because you, they kept telling you, you have to listen to your teachers. Now I found soon in life that I was much smarter than my teachers. So I didn't believe in them. And that was, I was lucky that way. I didn't believe in the teachers. I believed that I had to discover myself with my own mind what the principle was. And so I, you know, I hated Euclidean geometry, which is a piece of crap, a piece of nonsense. People were teaching people still today Euclidean geometry. It has no reality in the, in the world, real world. Most of the things that are taught by in mathematical processes are not crap. They don't have any reality to creativity. But there's, you're taught that your qualification of being advanced in the school system, of promotion in life after graduating from school, of going to higher levels of employ, employment, uh, employment, all of these things are rituals which have nothing to do with creativity and in fact become rituals which tend to destroy creativity. Because the slug, the stupid slug, who goes by a real rule book, has a better chance of getting the appointment than the guy who actually is creative. Well, that brings a conclusion to our broadcast for tonight. So I'd like to thank Lynn and I'd like to thank Cody for joining me and thank you all for tuning in. Good night.